Hello, welcome to another podcast in our Global Lead 2 interview series. I'm Jeremy Real with the GE2 team, and I'm here today with Wayne Ferreira, who is the co-founder of Ecolo Blue, a company that develops technology and other solutions to solve the water scarcity problems around the globe. He's joining us today to tell us a little bit more about his company, the technology that they've developed, and how they work around the world to distribute this technology. So thank you for chatting with us today, Wayne. Hey, Jeremy. Nice to be here. Uh, I'm very excited for you to join us today because Ecolo Blue is, from what I understand, the basic premise of the technology is to create drinkable water from the atmosphere. Uh, but I was hoping you could tell our listeners a little bit more about the technology, how it works, and how your company works to solve the w global water crisis. So I'd like to s ask a bit about the history of your company to start out, since new technologies often have good stories of idea making, sharing, and collaboration. These are things that our students are very interested in. So could you tell us a little bit about the company, how it came to be, and how long you guys have been going? Yeah, so just a quick, uh, you know, rough down on, on the technology. I mean, atmospheric water generator is a technology of making potable drinking water out of the humidity in the air. Basically, what it does is condense the air coming in, freeze it, um, drips it down through a filtration process. Uh, and produces drinking water. So it's a, it's a simple technology. It's uh, similarly related to dehumidification. So nothing too complex about it at all. And basically, uh, about eight years ago, um, I came across this technology, uh, liked it. I thought it was uh, a lot, very valuable, had a lot to offer, especially where we were going with uh, how, how scarce water is becoming. You know, I'm originally from South Africa. We always had some issues with water when I was a kid growing up. And, uh, you know, always had it in the back of my mind, like the technology started the company eight years ago. And, uh, since then I've been trying to push the product out into the world marketplace to make people aware of the technology and provide them a, another option to, to the, you know, the, the options that they have of finding water today. Oh, great. Um, so the, about the technology itself, uh, so you said it, 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 it freezes the water and then drips it down or just collects the water kind of like a a condensation process with the humidity how does it collect the uh how does it collect the the ambient humidity in an area so basically what it does is it runs off you know condenser and a compressor um working together with refrigerant and it does mm -hmm. it has it sucks the air into the condenser the humidity is frozen so it has you know the evaporator condenser condenser and evaporator mm -hmm. Uh, in the one on the one half of it, it gets frozen. Um, the the humidity base, uh, the wetness in the air gets frozen out of the air. The rest of the air gets blown out the back of the machine. Uh, it freezes, and then with the evaporator, it kind of thaws it out a little bit. It becomes water droplets. Um, due to the heaviness of it, it it falls downwards like like most water does, and uh, drops into a bottom holding tank. It then runs from there through. The filtration process. Uh, we have a bit of an overkill on our on our filtration process. The mm -hmm. air, the water out of the air is generally quite clean already. Um, but we have a twelve st a step process. We have carbon filters. We have a reverse osmosis. We actually have a mineral filter that we replace minerals back into the water because oh. the water itself is uh, is neutral. It has no mineral content. Um, it has the same content as distilled water. Yeah, it's just essentially distilled water then, right? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I mean, I distilled is obviously boiled, but ours is comes out the same equivalent with neutral value. So we add minerals back into the water. Um, you know, it's a it's a simple process. It's not not overly difficult. You can see it sometimes when you have uh, cold outside and and hot inside. You see water droplets forming on your window. Yeah, uh, it's a very it's a similar concept to that. You mentioned it, it runs on the kind of ambient humidity in an area. Does this not work then in low humidity areas like deserts? Yeah, so it, it's based on the humidity. Um, so depending on, on what your environment is, uh, it actually is based on two things. It's based on, well, three things actually. One on the, the heat and the, and the humidity, which gives you the, and the relative humidity, which ultimately is uh, deciphered around absolute humidity. And uh, the best environment for this technology is hot and humid. Um, it does work in lower humidity ranges. We, we are able to make the machine work in 20% humidity. Um, and if it's hot, it can even work down to 4 or 5% humidity. Huh. So it, it, there's a lot of environmental issues around uh, the production of the machine. But obviously, the hotter and more humid, the faster it will make water. So the production levels are much higher, as well as the cost per liter or gallon is, is better because you're producing more with the same energy output. 
Excellent. Um, are there any complementary technologies that go well with a color blue? Well, we have designed in our home office units a DC uh, unit, which is um, obviously uh, based around trying to apply it to solar applications. Um, I, I, one of our goals with the color blue is to get this product off grid um, to work on its own independently. Oh, yeah, yeah. And solar at this particular stage on the home office units is uh, is the best one where we're working in the larger industrial units with some other alternative energies uh, you know the typical wind and solar but we're also looking at other things like hydro uh, electric uh, the machine is making water there's a way of using that water to produce hydro uh, power as well as uh, looking to some uh, hydrogen power which at this stage is very difficult um, it can help the production levels but it's not going to make it independent so there are a few new technologies coming out that we're working with and trying to do because ultimately the goal would be to have this as an independent off-grid solution yeah that's really exciting i know that's another thing our students interact with are kind of the this food energy water nexus and uh energy being a lot of the challenge with things like desalination and and uh you know the trade-offs associated with how how much energy some of these technologies take Correct, um, and and our technology has that same issue where it is quite energy inducive, and it's uh, is the is the biggest focus that we have is to be able to get it to a stage where it's it's very cost effective. Yeah, uh, so talking about cost effectiveness, and I know you mentioned the filtration system and stuff, and I know that filters have to be replaced. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about what are some of the upkeep and maintenance requirements, and how long do these last? Yeah, I mean, the reason why we have such an elaborate filtration system is because our machines can be worked as hybrids as well. You can actually attach them to municipal water lines. You can actually, if really desperate, you can attach it to, uh, you know, if in, in, a, in, a, in a need, you can attach it to in use of pool water or brackish, brownish water, runoff, anything. You know, the, the filtration system is enough to be able to use, to use on all of that. Um, the carbon filters we have in the machine, you know, these are all recommended depending on how long you, how much you use it. These are recommended changes. The carbon filters are recommended every six months. The ROs, RO, we have one and we have three UV lights to kill the bacteria if there is any. Mm -hmm. These are, these are, um, recommended to change every two years. Okay. Um, what are some of the decisions that uh, people do when they're deciding to pick Ecola Blue as a, a solution for uh, their water scarcity issues? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's various stuff. There's, you know, we do a lot with the, the preppers and the, and the self-sufficient survivalists. You know, they're looking for, for emergency preparedness to be off-grid, uh, off but also have a, a source of water if there's any desperate times, uh, which, you know, always a scary thing to think about, but can possibly happen in the future. So we get a lot of them preparing themselves for the worst. And then we have a lot of, we call the eco moms who are looking for healthy water for their family and children. Um, you know, those are really the two main focus for us, uh, are the people who are, are, you know, preparing themselves as well as wanting the best quality water. And that's what makes this technology so good. It's not only the fact that it makes water out of the humidity in the air, but also the uh, the, um, the cleanliness and and uh, the mm -hmm. value of the water is also very very good. Great. Um, the uh, let's say a government or a local region uh, would want to implement your technology at a scale, right? So you know you think of desalination and it's usually meant to serve an entire municipality. Have you had any experiences with serving large municipalities or cities or towns? Yeah, I mean, we've actually in the process of, of working, we call it our water station. We have a different levels of water station. Our largest unit that we build is a two and a half thousand gallon unit, which equates to about 10,000 liters. We call it EB 10,000, 10,000 liter a day. And what we do is, uh, we, you know, in a redundancy way, we, we add them together to up to scale up to as much water as needed. Um, we have uh, a water station anywhere from, you know, 10,000 to 1 million liters of water. With all of the energy requirements um, proposals, we, we're looking to try to do one uh, in the near future. Um, so yes, I mean we, you know, obviously desal is pushing in hundreds of thousands of gallons a day. We can put in, you know, maybe thousands of gallons. But overall, you know, we are a water source that can be made and placed anywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, in in times of need or desperation, we certainly are, are a great value. Great. Um, so. 
you know, we're talking about these large scale projects. Do you have any uh, kind of uh, goals for the future, vision for the future for your company, uh, where you think the technology could go in the next 10 years or so? Yeah, I mean, we've been working a lot with different entities, uh, military, government, aid organizations, even municipalities. And uh, there's a lot of interest for our technology because obviously water is running out. Desal is, a, is an option, but sometimes not the most viable option. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of, of interest. Uh, this is still a relatively new uh, technology for a lot of them. There isn't a, a large amount of precedent out there for them to have seen this technology work for a long period of time. So there's a little bit of pushback from that that side. Uh, we do have a couple of projects that we're trying to implement, one in particular in the Middle East on, on a larger water station. Um, so the interest is there. There are some loopholes and things to go through. For instance, here in, the, here in California, we're working with municipalities, but um, our water machines have to be certified through the health organizations. Uh, it's not a technology that's on their list, therefore you've got to go through all of those requirements to become registered with them as a, as a potable drinking mm -hmm. source. So there's always, uh, you know, things to do before you can get to, to where you'd like to be and we're in the process of doing all of that. But there is definitely some good, uh, you know, feedback from everybody wanting this technology to really come out and, and be used everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have any particular challenges that you foresee uh, local governments, small municipalities, larger municipalities in implementing these kind of solutions that we've talked about? I uh, know just as I said, uh, going through the regulations of the requirements that they need. Mm -hmm. um, there's always a lot of loopholes to get through to be able to make it qualified as as uh, you know fi you know in in their lists of, of requirements so that that's really the only holding the only setback is holding us back right now um, other than that not really too much um, you know there isn't really much negative feedback for this technology uh, ex except just making it uh, fit all of the requirements okay and have you guys seen any do you guys have any good success stories? We'll put it that way. Have you, do you have any successes for different parts of the world with Ecola Blue or large kind of scaled up impact? Well, we've been, you know, focusing, we've been in business for eight years, we've been focusing the last sort of five to six years on our small home office units, which we've, we've distributed quite nicely here through the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, we, in that process, we were developing through R&D on the larger industrial units, which we have now done a pretty good job on in the last sort of a year and a half, and we're starting to push now on the larger scale. Uh, we have some of our um, partners and distributors that have the industrial units, uh, you know, in in, uh, in South America, in Africa, in Middle East, but it's still relatively new. And as I mentioned earlier about precedent, you know, that we haven't had a large or you know, a lot of them out there for people to really see it working yeah, in large yeah. capacities. So it's a, it's a process. Uh, it will it will get there. It's taking time, but we're certainly on the right path, and we're starting to get a lot more people aware of this technology and interested in it. Um, but these things take time. Yeah, but past the awareness, it is really exciting. It's a whole different way of collecting water. Uh, aside from you know, you're talking about in California, um, all the groundwater that's been all these aquifers that have been recently depleted. You know, looking for another water source aside from desalination. This is really exciting. Um, it will be really interesting to see where we go in the next ten years with this kind of technology. Yeah, correct. And then, you know, it will definitely go somewhere. There's no question. If you look at all the alternate sources that you have out there right now today, there are not a lot and people are really struggling. You know, we go to a lot of seminars where people talk about water problems, but nobody really ever talks about a solution to it. And this is definitely one of the most viable solutions to at least help out with, with the, uh, the problems we're facing today. Great. Well, that wraps up all the questions I had for you, Wayne. Um, thank you for taking the time to share your company's histories and goals with us today. Oh, absolutely no problem. And, and I hope that uh, the information I provided to you and your students will be very valuable for them because, as we all know, future revolves around the children uh, learning what's necessary to, to help the world and to grow into a better place. And hopefully they will be instrumental in, in keeping keeping this world a happy place and a, and a viable place for us to live. So uh, I yeah. hope that it's valuable to them. I think it is. Uh, it has been very informative for me as well. So thank you very much for coming. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, stuff in the future coming from the company. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.